Hi, I'm Dick Telford, and uh, I'm a physiologist and, and a coach, uh, and an old one at that, and you're li- listening to the Physical Performance Show. And the winner is... Failure is not an option. I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Welcome to another episode of the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by the Gold Coast Marathon and Pogo Physio. I trust you've been having a great week, and I trust that you've also been enjoying pursuing your own physical best performance. On today's episode, I share an absolute dynamite conversation with you that I had with one of Australia's most notable sporting figures, and that is athletics coach and sports scientist Dick Telford, AM. Where do you start with a bio for a gentleman like Dick Telford? Well, let's start with some of his formal bestowed recognitions. These include being recognized with the member of the order AM for the Australian Honours System for Dick's services to the sports and sports sciences. In 2017, Dick was named as the ACT Senior Citizen of the Year. Dick was recently inducted into the Sport Australia Hall of Fame. Dick was actually the first sports scientist appointed by the Australian Institute of Sport, the AIS. Dick also worked with the Australian swim team and Australian canoeing team in the capacity of exercise physiologist. Dick left the AIS physiology to take up a distance running coaching role with the AIS track and field. It was from here that Dick would go on to achieve some incredible feats with his athletes. Dick was the appointed Australian Athletics distance running coach at both the 1992 and 1996 Olympic Games. And Dick coached Lisa Rondecki to the silver medal in the women's marathon at the 1988 Seoul Olympic Games, Australia's only Olympic marathon medalist to date. So I hope you get your pen and paper out We focus on distance running and how to achieve your potential through exercise physiology pearls, tapering tips, marathon preparation tips, and a whole lot more. You are going to love Dick Telford, AM, sports scientist, distance running coach. Let's jump in. Dick Telford, this is an absolute pleasure for me. I have been an admirer of your work professionally since I was a young teenage triathlete eating sustain uh, cereal in the hope that that would uh, produce the performances that you were producing out of the AIS as a, the role of a head physiologist. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> My pleasure, Brad. Dick, uh, your career is very wide. It's very illustrious. You have achieved many things. You're a humble gentleman. Uh, as per the bio, you've worked in elite sports at the highest levels in your capacity as a coach, as a physiologist. You were the AIS's first uh, appointed uh, exercise physiologist. What would you say, though, Dick, out of all things you've achieved in your professional working career, stand as the greatest moments or joys for you? Ooh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's a big one, Brad. Um, when you talk about you know things that stand out, um, it's <laughs> a lot of years that I can flash back to now, even right back to days where I uh, you know, ran onto the Collingwood football ground as a young footballer, uh, as a 17-year-old from school, uh, playing in front of a, the final practice game of about 15,000, 20,000 people, never having played more than, you know, in front of more than probably half a dozen people and a few dogs. <laughs> you know, I can go back right back there, then, then to days where I worked with the Victorian cricket team uh, as their coaching coordinator when um, Frank Tyson handed me the job uh, looking after the uh, Sheffield Shield team and and we won a couple of uh, Sheffield Shields over the, those next couple of years. 
then I suppose um, um, Don Talbot, uh, the director of the Institute of uh, Sport, coming down out of the blue down to Melbourne to listen to me give a speech at um, Deakin University where uh, he um, just offered me the job of um, guiding sports science in Australia right from scratch at the AIS, right on the spot. And then I suppose, you know, all of the years through the the time where we went from winning four medals in Montreal, then opening up the Institute of Sport right through to a time where we won around 54 in, um, uh, in 96 and 2000 in Sydney. And, uh, you know, they were fantastic years where physiology, biomechanics, sports psychology, motor learning, sports medicine, uh, physiotherapy, linking it all in together, um, produced the goods at the AIS, and that was copied all around Australia with the institutes of sport in each state, which was a, a highly significant factor in, in those in, increased 50 medals. Then I, um, then you could go on. Well, I'm leaving out a lot of things, but finally to my own coaching career, where I've uh, accumulated probably more medals in Commonwealth Games and and uh, and Olympics, and I think as someone told me any other distance coach or any um, that Australia's had in previously. So I can go back to all those medals and uh, the performances that people have put in over the years, and the time that I. Um, first paired up with Robert De Costello as the first person I employed at the Institute of Sport. Uh, and he, um, with his coach, Pat Lahesse, coming up later, he became world champion within a couple of years of, of coming to Canberra, which was phenomenal. So there are so many things, Brad. And, and then I could go on to the last 10 years where the research I'm doing with young kids, uh, looking at how f- important physical education and physical activity is in, in the physical and, and psychological development and uh, cognitive development of young children. That's a fascinating area. And uh, uh, and most recently, I'm going to be doing a lot of work up there with, with you and we're up there around uh, Brisbane and Gold Coast, working in early child care centres. And we're opening up a new big project uh, in a couple of weeks' time, as a matter of fact, in early child care centres around Gold Coast and uh, Brisbane, so a lot of things. So sorry to have gone on for so long about that. Dick, uh, no need to apologise. It's it really they are really just very brief bullet points on what is an you know an incredible career. And even obviously the Gold Coast you just mentioned, we've just come off the back of the 2018 Gold Coast Commonwealth Games, and you know obviously you coached Michael Shelley there to a uh, defending his title in the men's marathon, and Lisa Waitman to that sterling silver medal performance in the marathon so though that day must have been quite special the, the gold coast marathon uh sorry the uh the commonwealth games recently for you being there on the sidelines to embrace both michael and lisa at the end well you know that that's fantastic if somebody the other day asked me about my memories of you know what sticks in my mind uh, and i sort of went right back through two times with andrew lloyd winning a gold medal at auckland and you know with him not being really uh uh, impressing the selectors enough to want to have him in the side, yet he won that gold medal. But more recently, they're, they're the things, of course, that uh, uh, will always be indelible. Uh, the, the, the way that Lisa uh, Waitman and Michael Shelley, having coached those people for a long time, in fact, Michael, I've coached for, I think he said the other day, I've coached him for 15 years. That's a long time. Um, so uh, that sort of experience makes coaching uh, absolutely worthwhile as, as any coach and, and you would know and they are both such humble humble champions as well it's uh they're incredible people uh dick you're running yourself before we get practical on some uh, physiological coaching type topics you were a very handy marathoner you, you clocked a pb of 227 uh, in the Melbourne Marathon, I think you started that in 1978. You went 312, and then you followed up within five marathons to run that 227. So, quite clearly, you were a talented runner. You also, uh, I believe, won a, a medal in the World Masters Games on the track, and had the uncanny uh, exit from uh, from your running days, your your career sort of uh, competitive running days of running your best times on the way out on the track. I think in the eight, the fifteen hundred, five, and ten. Tell us a little bit about your own running, Dick. <laughs> yeah, well, I must admit I do have a chuckle about that that last statistic that the very last 
events I have have won. Uh, sorry, uh, I have run. Um, from 800, 1500, 3K, 5K, 10K, half marathon and marathon, the very last races I ran were all my PBs. And I always uh, say to my athletes, you're never going to be able to do this. (laughs) You're not going to be able to emulate your coach's performance there. But the reason is is that they're all better athletes than me while they're young and they're producing all these these top performances while they're young. And as they get older, there's no way known they're going to be able to get quicker like I did. And because I didn't start running until I was probably 32 or 33 after I'd finished coaching football and cricket and playing football and cricket, and I had that head start. But then, uh, you know, the old cunning uh, physiology coach comes into, into play when I sort of work up the best ways to train, knowing I can improve each year in a particular event as I get older, but understanding that there comes a time where I reckon I've done just about as much as I'm ever going to be able to do. And that means, yes, I'll run that PB, never run that race again. <laughs> so that's the way I've gone. It's a, it's a nice little record to have under my belt to talk to the young athletes about. It's a brilliant uh, it's a brilliant story. I mean, you got down to 158 for the 800, 357 for the 15, 109 for the half. So you're no slouch. You're still running now, Dick. Uh, what do you love about running? Oh, well, nowadays, uh, it's, you know, I, I never, ever, um, you know, because of uh, football and squash and things like that, I, I, you know, my my limiting factor has definitely been my hips. But but basically now, uh, you know, and hammering them around, but basically now I, I know I just can't run quickly where, you, you know, you're bounding along and using all the forces that you know much more about than what I do. Um, so what I do is I generally um, just get out and thoroughly enjoy myself. For example, this morning... Uh, it was very brisk in Canberra, as it often is. We're 2,000 feet up in the air, and the snow is not too far away. And I just ran at the back of my place, which is not far from uh, Parliament House. I ran up a place called Red Hill to the top of Trig Point of Red Hill, up a, a fairly steep uh, dirt road where uh, there's a lot of kangaroos and uh, a lot of uh, uh, parrots of all descriptions. And you can look across Parliament House and across Canberra and you see a little the, the cloud down below you. And I only ran for 40 minutes. And when and I wouldn't even call it running. I'd call it jogging. But the fact is I'm sort of running up a hill. There's no real stress. It might be a little bit of stress on the lungs, even though I don't puff that much running up that hill. Uh, so it's just thoroughly enjoyable now to, to, to get me feeling good for the rest of the day. That's the way I do it. Well, you really do practice what you preach. Dick, changing gears here, uh, through your coaching, physiology, extensive knowledge you developed over, over the decades, what would Dick Telford say are the top three characteristics required for optimal athletic performance? I have heard you reference before this concept of a, a big engine and a smooth engine, so I'm presuming that that might come into one of these top three characteristics. You prompted me well there, Brad. Um, uh, there's just so many things that m- contribute to good athletic performance in uh, all sorts of sports, and of course they vary um, according to the, the particular sport we're talking about. But if we stick to a, a basic sport like running, um, you're, you're right. Um, a, a runner who a runners are going to be limited by the capacity of their engine. And we often, particularly their aerobic engine, and we often talk about uh, VO2 max, which is an indirect way of measuring the capacity of the engine because we can measure the amount of oxygen that that someone can actually utilise, and that's proportional to the size of their engine. So that's one way. But then the other aspect that, that contributes to a very good runner is that when they're cruising along at any given speed, whether it be a, a speed of a, at a 1500 meter race or a 5k race or a marathon race, they actually use less energy than somebody who is um, uh, not as well equipped in that way. So in other words, this efficiency thing is, is uh, particularly important. And using, using less energy means that uh, with a bigger engine and uh, a smoother engine, then when the time comes, for example, in a 1,500-metre race and the bell's rung and you've got one lap to go, generally that particular person with either of those characteristics or 
or hopefully both, is going to feel a lot better, going to have a lot less um, instability, if you like, or uh, or change in, in their system and their biochemistry. We call it homeostasis. Their homeostasis is, is more close to what it was when they started. They're feeling better and they can come home faster. They're the better runners. So the physiology, um, and there's a couple of points, um, is very, very important. But then we've got the psychology and the biomechanics. You know, it's no point in having, or if we're just sticking to running, it's no, it, it's, 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 I've had plenty of runners that have had super engines and great efficient engines, but they haven't had the, the, uh, the anatomy, the chassis that's going to carry them through to be able to train. No matter who, how good people are, they've got to be able to train and and uh, push the envelope there if they want to get to international level. Uh, and if they haven't got the body to do that, uh, then that's that's difficult. You know, the, the likes of um, Michael Shelley, for example, uh, Rob DiCostello, Steve Monaghetti, those sorts of people. More recently, the likes of, uh, you know, uh, Jess Trengrove and uh, uh, Lisa Waitman, although for a while there, before I coached Lisa Waitman, she had a lot of stress fractures. But once we work out what's going on, and I did that with people like yourself, sports medicine people that understand how to how to uh, to work with the body. With me as a physiologist and a coach, Lisa has uh, had a really good run over the last six years, and and uh, just in her, you know, just to to verify that for her to run two hours twenty five and fifteen seconds at the age of just on thirty nine and run a PB, well, actually, she's one that's <laughs> I've got to watch because she's running a PB as she gets older as well. So I have to put an end to that. She might break my record. <laughs> no, that's brilliant. And, Dick, so, you know, the physiology, the psychology, the biomechanics there, and I know it's a very difficult question, so thank you for giving a, a consolidated, you know, response on that, and I, I love that concept, big engine, smooth engine. Dick, first-time marathoners, it can be a Pandora's box. Uh, what would be your top tips for first-time marath- marathoners, just broadly speaking? Well, it's probably similar to what I'd be saying to uh, you know some of my top marathoners, really. You've just got to run within the limits that you know you've got. There's no point unless, you know, in most of the times, there's no point if you're in an important race, and most marathons are pretty important races where you're running your first one, your third one, you're, you're running either the Gold Coast Marathon or you're running the, the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games Marathon or the Olympics, they're all important because you have to build up for months before these things and everybody, no matter who they are, will get a bit toey and nervous about putting their foot in the line and knowing they've got to try and get through 42.195k as well as they possibly can, even though there's really only a handful of people know they're running it in some circumstances, let alone others that have got the whole world looking at them. So you've got to run within your limits, Brad, and... um, and that means that uh, you set yourself uh, those limits based on what your coach or yourself has come up with in terms of saying, well, this is reasonable. I think this pace is reasonable, that if I go over this pace, uh, I'm going to be using too much glycogen per kilometre. I'm going to run out of glycogen at the end, which is a big limiting factor, running out of fuel in a marathon, and uh, and I'm going to possibly hit that wall and have to walk or, you know, struggle to get the last few cane. And we see top marathoners doing that, e.g. Hawkins in the last um, Commonwealth Games marathon, but lots of runners that just run out of fuel. And as I've probably mentioned before, uh, you, know, you can have that Ferrari engine, but the Ferrari, Ferrari engine runs out of fuel, it's, it's worth nothing. And that's what happens at the end of a marathon. And it's, marathoners have got to know their limits and run according to those limits. Yeah, no, that's a great advice. Dick, talking about fueling marathons, fueling endurance performance, you know, contemporaries of yours such as, you know, Tim Noakes, etc. cetera, uh, there's been that big sort of, Emergence, if you like, of the ketogenic type diets, high ca- sorry, low carb, high fat. What do you, what's Dick Telford's views around you know some of this more recent view around change in fuel sources? 
I haven't taken any notice of it. I haven't even read about it, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, you've been too busy. <laughs> well, not really. You just use basic physiology. Now, over the years, I've seen uh, people come up with all sorts of diets. I haven't changed my mind since I did nutrition and biochemistry at Melbourne University, you know, in the early days down there. I haven't changed at all. You, you look at what the nutrients do, what they're... Uh, the amount of oxygen uh, they need to generate a certain amount of ATP, um, and there are differences between carbohydrates and fats and all of those sorts of things. You understand, you know, where you can get the best power from, where you can get the best uh, type of efficiency from in terms of utilising oxygen, that sort of efficiency. And it comes down to the fact that, that when athletes train, um, no matter what diet they're on, even if they're on a pure carbohydrate diet, they're going to learn to use more fats at any given level of running, even though they don't eat any fats, because you just convert carbohydrate to fat anyway, you know, in, in the in the body. That's that's easily done. Not easily to go the other way around, to convert fats to carbohydrates. So anyone would be silly to try and embark on uh, a marathon program or a program that involves uh, elite level sport trying to work on a high fat diet i've never heard of anything so silly in all my life i mean that'd be the way i'd, I'd uh, you know you'd nobble nobble a runner if you wanted to, to to try and that and and despite the fact that you will adapt more to a high fat diet as you go you're never ever going to be able to run as well on the high fat diet as you are on a mixed diet where you've got sufficient carbohydrates to to fuel where you want to fuel that anaerobic component of your energy yeah, look, interesting view, big topic, interesting views, but very practical, right? Common sense prevails. Dick, you're, you've spoken about the cloud of fatigue, removing the cloud of fatigue from runners. Can you just touch on that for a moment? What do you mean by that sort of phrase, you must remove the cloud of fatigue from your runners before an event? I think I might have first mentioned this cloud of fatigue when I was working with Bill Sweetenham and uh, at the Institute of Sport and, and uh, later on with Laurie Lawrence and, uh, and other swim coaches around, around the place. Um, but, you know, with Bill, you know, we worked on a, a lot with uh, learning how best to taper, you know, taper swimmers. Some swimmers would go in and into a big event and uh, after training really well for months and, and not swim anywhere near their best and uh, until perhaps later on where they had a bit more rest and suddenly found they swum better when it was all over. They'd lost their place in the Australian team or what it happened to be. So we, we learnt by trial and error a little bit. And all, all I mean by this, this um, in this t one of the things I used to talk about with uh, swim coaches originally when I was the physiologist there with the swim team, um, and with uh, Pac Lahesi and, and, and the likes of uh, Rob DeCastell and all those others that were at great runners at the, you know, at the uh, Institute of Sport, um, then uh, it was a case of your fitness you build up gradually week by week by week by week and you're building up the fitness but at the same time you've, you're building up this fitness you often got this little cloud of fatigue that's hovering around there. You can get rid of it sometimes and get good sessions out and then it comes back again. But you're always, you know, particularly for the long distance runners, running a little bit tired. And a lot of the times the marathoners who are running 200K plus a week, they've got that cloud of fatigue over them. So when the time comes to taper over the, the, the last two to three weeks before a marathon, you, you can continue on doing some good sessions but you can remove a lot of the volume around that, not all of it, but a lot of the volume around that and the type of sessions to remove the cloud of fatigue and let and let the fitness, which has been improving all the way through and hasn't changed much, but the performance is a thing that, that changes dramatically when the cloud of fatigue is removed on top of that fitness, if you like, and uh, the performance comes through and... And as a coach and as a physiologist, I thought one of the most important things that I had to contribute towards um, the athletes I was working with was learning how to get the best performance out of an athlete at the right time. And uh, that's critical, of course, for championship events. You're listening to Dick Telford. Australian distance running coach, exercise physiologist, sharing around insights from his incredible career to date. Support for today's show comes from the Gold Coast Marathon. 
Just like the Physical Performance Show, the Gold Coast Marathon encourages runners of all ages and abilities to push their boundaries and strive to complete a personal challenge. Scene of Lee Troop's famous 2006 Australian Marathon Championship winning run, the Gold Coast Marathon is held annually on the first weekend in July and is a must-do event for any budding athlete, weekend warrior, or family looking for a challenge to complete together. Run for the good times at the Gold Coast Marathon. Visit goldcoastmarathon.com.au. Support for today's show also is lovingly brought to you by Pogo Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. We want everyone who walks through the doors of Pogo Physio to finish rehabilitation and cross your physio finish line. In addition to traditional session-to-session appointments, we offer some industry-first models of care, including our unique wellness booster monthly packages and our 2, 6, and 12-week fixed-fee unlimited access finish line programs. These help you save money and recover faster. To find out more about Pogo Physio's unique services, including unique services or to schedule your one hour initial appointment jump over to pogophysio.com.au but for now let's jump back with dick telford so dick you mentioned there the the cloud of fatigue removing the cloud of fatigue if if someone's preparing for their first marathon and they're you know not sure on how to remove the cloud of fatigue any sort of tips you'd give them i i certainly find in my work as a physiotherapist that and, and my own running with marathons and halves, I think I've always taken to the start line still under a cloud of fatigue because I'm just too scared to, to pull back on the miles and, you know, and then feel the weight gain, which is obviously some of that carbo loading, that glycogen being stored up. So what advice would you give to people about to tackle their first marathon with regards to removing that cloud of fatigue? Yeah, well, yeah, that, that really does really come down to a, an individual thing. Brad, no no question about that. Uh, If you've got someone that's running 210 kilometres a week and then you've got another runner that's running 80 kilometres a week but's doing one long run, uh, there's that cloud of fatigue obviously is very, very different. So it could be, for example, that a runner that's just running 80 kilometres a week and doing a a long run of 25k on, on Sunday wouldn't have to change their training at all. They they just, all they'd have to do is run exactly the way they run right up to the Sunday before with their long run of 25K and then then just have an easy week. Do everything about, you know, do everything by half. Do, if you, if you normally do a session, as a lot of runners do on the Tuesday and the Thursday, do half the session on the Tuesday. If, it's, if you're doing, say, if you're used to doing six or seven Ks on a Tuesday, for example, uh, you might just do three Ks. You wouldn't want to do nothing, though. You don't want to just jog around for the week. Um, you don't want all the systems to start running down. You're not going to hurt yourself running three three times 1K if you're used to doing 6K every Tuesday. You just wouldn't do it flat out. What you want to do is you want to touch up that motor and remind it it's going to have something something to work out in a, in a few days' time, but you don't want to give it complete rest either. One of the things I never do with my athletes is give them uh, a whole lot of days of just jogging around. Uh, you just mentioned it before that your muscles will start to feel a little bit sluggish. You'll feel a bit sluggish because when you do put on glycogen you'll, in, into your muscles, you start to store it, you store it with a, a certain amount of water and you will feel a bit sluggish. And often a marathon runner might feel a little bit better after they've run 5 or 10K into their race rather than right at the end. People have to understand those things and, and run accordingly. Yeah, so the, the, so there's a, there's a lot to it. I mean, um, Dick, if uh, if we're looking at say something like recovery uh, in training, what what would you say are the things that we could be aware of with recovery in terms of uh, from sessions? What are some of the key things that help athletes get ready for the next session that you've discovered over your career to date? I think recovery comes from from getting fitter and for the particular event. There's no question about that. Uh, Michael Shelley, for example, recovers a lot more rapidly from anything he does now than what he did five years ago. And we'd be doing similar training sessions, but he'd recover a lot more rapidly from those training sessions so that now he can actually do more in training. Now, we, we haven't seen that 
transpose into his faster marathon. Um, and that's a goal that Michael and I have got, you know, to get him into a, a sub-10 marathon shape. But but he certainly does put it together when he when it's count. He's a, he's a, gr- he's a great championship runner, a great competitor. Um, but um, uh, we, 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 were, we were wanting to, to get him up into those top few Australians have run sub sub 210, which is not a super run these days when people are running 2.4 and 2.5, or, but the sub 210 does put him in that special class, and I'd like to see him there as well as, as being legendary now in terms of his, his championship running. Yeah, absolutely. Dick, this on the taper, I, I should have asked there, how late would you leave the last hard session? You said you don't want to jog around all week, but you've got a marathon on a Sunday. Uh, what's the, the latest that you'd go out and fire up that neuromuscular system with a little bit of an effort? A bit of an effort on well, what we normally do. Uh, it'll vary according to ath- athletes as well, but um, we would normally uh, have um, uh, an aerobic stimulus session on, on Tuesday. Um, we do. We would certainly do some race pace work on on the, during other days, including Thursday and sometimes Friday before a Sunday marathon. And uh, even even when they're going for a jog, just to I like people to to feel as though they're doing a you know their, their neuromuscular systems being being utilised at the rate it's going to be utilised during the race, even if it's just doing some some strides of. 30 second or one minute efforts at race pace which for a marathon or at race pace is not difficult at all it's you could do that as part of your warm-up and you know which we do um and uh, it's it's not going to it's not going to u- utilize any any of that glycogen we we talked about as being so important so a good warm-up and some little bit of race pace work is important and it can prove to be beneficial in the long run because being warmed up, you're, you're more likely to be able to reduce the proportion of glycogen to fat that you are using in the early parts of the race. So you don't want to go into a race and suddenly having to run quickly off the mark with a whole bunch of other people sprinting out like, you know, cut cats. Now, that's not the way you should be doing it. should be well warmed up and going out at a steady pace and gradually getting to over, you know, a few hundred metres, getting into your race pace and you should be there well warmed up. To save to save the uh, glycogen stores for as late in the race as possible. Yeah, well, it is possible. Yeah, that's true, Brad. Because um, it is possible that if, if, for example, you are very nervous, and and um, one thing where that would increase um, production of lactate, for example, and production and utilising that util, utilisation of glycogen. Um, if you are nervous and then go out too hard, you could waste a lot of that glycogen early. You you could. You could pay the penalty later on and not get that PB you're after. Dick, in terms of volume reduction, say for a taper, you know what? What was say Lisa Waitman and uh, Michael Shelley's? What did their vo- how did their volumes reduce just before their success at the Com Games here on the Gold Coast? Well, again, that'll 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 vary because we always work individually. That'll, that'll vary even for them. I, I would change that, and depending on how they feel, um, from one race to another. So there's no sort of magic number that I say, oh, we're going to do, you know, 60K, 80K, 100K, 120K. It's not like that. But what I do talk to them about is how we're, how they feel and how they're recovering, what their legs feel like, how, what their head feels like and what they're doing. Because a runner, when you get really fit, can go out and jog for a long time and use very little glycogen and still feel good. And they've got to have their metabolism ticking along. They've got to get their – they don't want to suddenly change everything that – changes their whole metabolism and you know the, their way of life uh, we want to keep things as normal as possible but to still store the glycogen so we just it's often it might come down to they might be running you know uh easy run a couple of a couple of easy runs on an easy day say on the wednesday before a marathon they might run uh an easy 10k in the morning an easy 8k at night it's 18k it might sound a lot but if you're jogging it it's nothing for these people but for someone that's uh, you know a, a, a three hour thirty marathoner that's not doing that many miles, that that'll be too much. And I would say don't run twice a day. Go out and and do if you're if you've done a little bit of a spike session as I call it, on the Tuesday where you're spiking up the aerobic system, just letting it know it's being used. You might go out and on, on the uh, Wednesday and go for an easy eight k run. That's it for the day. 
and then and that so it all vary, it all depends on the on the run out there brad dick uh pacing strategies what's in your mind what's the best way to pace a marathon like looking at a you know a negative split or an even split or one percent either way um in order to run as fast as you can yeah um i think it it, it have to say that um running evenly all the way is in theory I've, i don't know the answer to that question brad but you'd have to say that in theory the less number of times you change your pace the more likely you are to conserve your energy so the worst you could do would be to go out and run a marathon and say right i'm going to i'm going to go out this marathon i'm going to run the first k solid the second k easy the third k solid the next k easy and so on uh, that that'd be the worst scenario so the best scenario as i see it is getting out there on that that pace that race pace that um that you feel comfortable with and from your experience you know roughly what you previous say if you run a marathon in three hours 30 and you're trying to run an hour at three hours 20 then three hours 30 pace you'll go out at three hours 30 pace and gradually ease it up into a three hours 20 pace and see how you feel if you start puffing too much you know you're using more glycogen the more you puff the more glycogen you're using simple <laughs> straight line graph <laughs> on that one <laughs> So athletes have got to feel pretty good for the first 30k of their race to prepare themselves for the last 12.195k. Yeah, brilliant. Keeping it simple. Uh, Dick, uh, the zone, get in flow state. You know, uh, I ask all athlete guests of the show this, you know, to describe the zone. You've got your own experience as a 227 marathon runner yourself and a world masters medalist on the track. Uh, and then you've got your athletes' experiences. But to you as a physiologist, as a, you know, as a distance coach, to you what's the concept of the zone mean like what does it look like you know how do you what do you think's happening physiologically to a to a runner when they do get in that sweet spot yeah i don't, I don't ever think about zones um and and those sort of, I, I understand what what is meant by getting into a zone i can see it when i watch footballers play and cricketers and, and tennis players that you know you 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 can get into a zone where you're right on top of your opponent, you know, as a tennis player, for example, then things change around. You've just won the first set 6-1. <laughs> a couple of things get go wrong and, and, and then you start doing things that you weren't doing in the first set and you, you lose it all and, and you lose the second set 1-6. You know, and that happens. It, it happens to the very best of players. They, they're in the zone for one p- bit of the time and they're not in the zone for the next. And they've got to find a, a way to get back into it. But with my runners, um, you know, I don't think about that. We just, I just think about them being in the zone all the time and, uh, and just getting, to, getting prepared for, a, for the performance they, where they really want to run well, to, to be working towards that performance so that, uh, you know, one of my runners was asking me the other day, can I run this race, uh, you know, next weekend? And so, sure, you can run this race next weekend. And uh, that, that's fine. But it's not going to be the fastest half marathon you've ever run. You're going to be running your fastest half marathon in two years' time. You know, but you can you can run well there, but don't ever think this is going to be the best one you ever run. But get out and run it the best you can now, but it's only a start. And, uh, you know, I think it's... Uh, the Sydney Mar- Half Marathon next this next weekend. I've got a few people going up there, so they're in that sort of boat. But they're in a good enough zone to run well. When they're at, in a good enough zone to run at the very best they've ever been, that'll be when a time where I think they've trained for long enough and well enough to have reached very, very close to the, their, their maximum potential. But, you know, I, I'm often guessing at that. I mean, you know, you have a good guess at it sometimes, um, yeah. but I, I just don't think anyone... I, I, anyone ever reaches that that line where you've got to your very very best? You know, Lisa Waitman. She's 39 now. She ran in her last before the Commonwealth Games at London. She ran a PB, 2:25, and uh, 2:25:15, I think it was. And um, my immediate reaction to that is, wow, oh, gee, what are we going to do now to get her under 2:25? Um, and she might be getting on towards 40. Well, what the hell? She's run, at 30, she's run at 39. She can run 224 at the age of 40. Why not? So uh, there's, 
she can get in the zone and Lisa gets in the zone pretty well and so does Michael and so do the other top runners if we call it a zone. I, yeah. I just don't refer it to a zone. I just prefer it to being well prepared and confident in what they're doing. Oh, absolutely brilliant. Dick, uh, the role of strength training, uh, you know, anything you'd add on your all your years of, years of wisdom in, in how that helps an athlete prepare or, you know, obviously there's an injury minimization side of it, but for, on, in terms of performance, is there anything that you specifically would highlight in that field or that, that area? Only that all other things being equal, if an athlete is stronger and can uh, develop more power in in a in a contraction of a large muscle group like your your legs and backside, um, then you're likely to be a better runner in one way or another. But the problem is, can you do all that strength work and and train as well uh, in the other aspects of your uh, characterization of, of fitness for your particular race? So it's all going to be a balance, you know. You, I, I can't just go to my athletes and say, right, we're, we're all going to do this, this strength this strength work and we're going to be doing these weights on Monday and Wednesday and Friday and we're going to train Tuesday and Thursday and Saturday morning and Sunday and, and you're going to train twice a day running. And I mean, there's a limit to what human beings can do. So we've got to balance it out. But I do feel uh, that strength work becomes more and more important the less of the distance that you are competing over. Incredibly important for 100 metre sprinters, not as important for marathoners. When I say that, I'm talking about traditional strength work, but the strength work we would give our marathoners would be technique work running up hills. That's good strength work. You're lifting your body weight against gravity, which you're not going to be doing in a marathon race, uh, except in every stride where you, you're jumping up and down and putting the next foot, your left foot down, then your right foot down, your the system of little parabolas. But basically, you know, what 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 we're doing with the strength work of a, a distance runner might be more, you know, squat jumps and uh, some some uh, upper body work for the running muscles and the arms and so on. But it's low key stuff compared to what the sprinters would be doing in the gym where they're developing high power work. And I'd say that's that's uh, just uh, crucial for for for, dis- for middle uh, for sorry for sprinters. But not, but not for the middle distance and the distance runners. But the middle distance runners, Brad, would be somewhere in between. They've got to be strong. They've got to be able to run fast. There's no question that a 1,500 metre runner worth his salt's got to be a very, very fast 200 metre runner. So they've got to do the strength work. Yeah, got to do it. It's fascinating. I mean, running up hills, Dick. So therefore, you, I guess if you're looking to run your best distance event, you know, say a half marathon, a marathon, you, you know, you'd want to be doing some hill running there. Oh, yes. I think variety in running is incredibly important, not just for, um, you know, variety of terrain, variety of shoes, variety of um, um, the hills and and the flat, uh, as well as the surfaces. That's what I meant by terrain before. Uh, Running on grass a lot, staying off hard tracks with spikes, um, very dangerous running on hard tracks with spikes. Uh, that to me is probably the greatest threat to a runner's career that I ever come across, and uh, I think that running up hills is um, is a very very good way to develop that power without running as fast as what you would be running on the flat, and by running slower, I think it does a lot in, to increase the variety of running and therefore reduce the chance of being injured. And just to be clear, Dick, do you mean hill repeats at effort or like a long run rolling over, you know, rolling hills? Well, I don't see a lot of difference. Okay. You know, some people say they go for an easy long, you know, I might, might have heard minor and these people like Deke and say, oh, I just go for an easy long run on Sunday. <laughs> I don't know the way Deke used to run and I, I would imagine minor would be something similar when he got, went at the Fernie Creek but Deke up here in Stromlo. Yeah. Um, and I used to tag behind him for long enough for part of his runs. Any part of his runs, I'd never try and go with. <laughs> um, but when you're running up a hill, and he's, he reckons he's taking it easy, that's not what I think is taking it easy. <laughs> so a long, easy run. When people like these champions describe a long, easy run, is a series of very hard hills, often very okay. hard hills with some easy parts in between. You're listening to Dick Telford, member of the Order Australia, sharing around his career, highs, lows, and his many, many learnings. If you missed last week's episode featuring US rising distance marathon star 
Laura Thweet, then here is a little snippet. I guess I kind of just get like a kind of like a calm goes over me and you're just you're just in the moment. Um, And I also think that's why I love running and racing so much because you can't really be anywhere else. Like you have to be you're so focused in on what you're doing. Yeah, it's just kind of being in the moment for me and just, you know, focusing at the task at hand and like nothing else interferes with that. To tune in to the full episode featuring Laura Thweet, be sure to jump over to the archives of the show found at the show notes for Pogo Fizz or peruse your favourite podcast player for the show's archives. For now, let's jump back to Dick Telford sharing around the highs, the lows and the learnings of his incredible coaching and exercise physiology sports science career to date. Dick, uh, you know, we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, acclimatization. I mean, getting ready for a, a race like you know the heat of the Gold Coast uh, Marathon recently for the Com Games. Uh, you know, you mentioned Lisa living in Melbourne, Michael on the Gold Coast. You know, is it just a matter of trying to spend more time in the environment you're going to race in? You know, whether it's you know hot conditions or cooler conditions. What, any tips there physiologically or from a coaching point of view? A lot of championship marathons are in warm conditions because they're held in the summer and they're the ones people normally avoid if you're a marathon runner uh, if you want to run your fastest marathon you're not going to run in temperatures above you know 17 degrees because you're just going to overheat and when you overheat you're going to use as we talked about before you're going to use more glycogen and you're going to run out of uh, that fuel tank's going to sort of get down towards the red line level a lot earlier if you're running in warm and particularly human conditions so the best way to train for a championship marathon is going to is train in the conditions that you're going to be working in, and that includes humidity, is, which is different than just heat. So uh, that that that's crucial. So with Michael, he had it made because he was living on the Gold Coast, perfect. And a few times he couldn't, unfortunately, couldn't train as well as what he could have, uh, and we and had to abort some training sessions because it was just too hot, too humid. So that's a disadvantage. Um, but Lisa. Uh, she was training in Melbourne. Melbourne gets pretty warm, um, and uh, it's not far from the sea. It's reasonably humid. She was training in pretty good conditions. When it was colder, I would get her to train in parts of the day where she could. I know she has to balance out family life and work life and so on. But where she could, to put more clothes on, create that sort of uh, microclimate around her body and train in the, the warmest parts of the day if Melbourne weather wasn't, uh, wasn't as good. So... It's a case of just doing everything you possibly can to uh, maximise the, the effects of training for, for running in, in championship races. And uh, if we don't maximise everything or we leave things to chance, well, there's a big chance that those runners aren't going to run as well. And we, we never leave things to chance as much as we possibly can. Yeah, that's brilliant. Dick, uh, we've got one, uh, this is time for a, one listener question here, and that's come from Lauren. Uh, and Lauren asks, you know, assuming... You've got an okay base behind you. What's the best way to progress as a middle distance runner in the winter season versus the summer season? So I guess it's a question of, you know, yearly cycles. Well, um, I think in the days of uh, Sir Roger Bannister, he would have said that the only work you do is fast work and, you know, you work on the track and you run your 12 400s and try and run them in 60 seconds because you've got to run a four-minute mile. Um, that's one way to look at it. But nowadays it's not... It, again, it, it's horses for courses and depends on the athlete. I, I would train two 1,500-metre two runners differently. Um, I think in my squad now I've got four or five runners that would be have run the uh, either four-minute mile or the equivalent thereof. So, you know, in other words, they've run 342 for a for a 1,500 metres down to 330, 337 high. Uh, but they're all sub four minute, But they would all train differently. Uh, and you can see on the track that they can't all train the same. They can't do the same speed. They Some need more rest, or if they're going to run the same speed, they they won't do it for the next rep- repetition. So it's all different. But in a nutshell, we would do a lot more aerobic work to, to develop the aerobic system and the power of that aer- the aerobic system to develop their max VO2 and their, and their efficiency and so on, just like you would for a 5 and 10K runner. We would do that over the winter. Uh, all the coaches would know that you build up uh, what we call a base, but I, I would probably be more inclined now, and I think I'm hoping it'll 
bear some fruit with the likes of Jordan Gusman and those sort of people who's Jordan as I speak is over in um, he's over in uh, America now about to run a race tomorrow uh, in uh, California but he's pretty fit at the moment and I'm hoping that uh, his aerobic base will will come come to the fore so that he can run a the fastest 1500 that he's ever run in his life <laughs> uh, tomorrow go, go Jordan Dick uh, last two questions what do you think the greatest myth of distance running training is the greatest myth greatest myth um i don't know if it's a myth anymore but (laughs) um you obviously a lot of runners in the past and and i'm talking about even 30 years ago you know some of the top runners Derek clayton and these sort of people thought that the the more you could do the better it's going to the faster you're going to run now I, i don't know if i'd call that a myth because if you could adapt to that more work, then then th- there's probably some truth in it. And Derek Clayton got to run two eight. I think he ran two eight thirty three for, and that was incredible. Nineteen sixty eight or something like that. He did that by you know doing things like um, you know going out for four fifty k runs hard and then running two hundred and seventy five k a week or thereabouts or or stories where he put a a little pebble in his shoe to run with a bit more pain than what he you know, would normally would. Um, I, I think if we're going to talk about a myth, then we, I think it's a myth that having to do those extraordinary things uh, to push yourself past the limit is um, is something that we might have thought once upon a time was going to work, but we now know that all that's going to do is lead to uh, the biomechanical breakdown of the body and a, and a short career. So more is not always better, but certainly there still needs to be some uh, kilometres on in, on the clock, right? And enough, enough. But what is enough? Some yeah. runners can enough is more than for, yeah. <laughs> enough. Enough is is different too for different runners. Some runners can run two hundred twenty k and run it really well with quality. Other runners can only do one hundred and fifty k, one hundred and forty k, and still be at their best for running a marathon. Uh, but one hundred some fifteen hundred meter runners might run one hundred and fifty k. Uh, during the winter. Others will run 100K and still be at their best. So it just depends on what the physiology is like and how that person is likely to respond. And that that only comes with the experience with a coach. Ah, uh, Dick, this is probably going to be an impossible question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If if you could boil down everything you've learned in your incredible career, you know, uh, physiology, sports science, uh, coaching, your own athletic endeavours, to one bit of advice to people listening in to pursue their physical best performance, what's Dick Telford's solitary piece of advice, the most important pearl of wisdom, going to be? Oh, yeah, that is a that is a, a difficult one um, because it's difficult for me because my piece of advice, if I'm ever asked for it, would vary depending on who I'm talking to. So that's that the the individuality of of the way I see each athlete is uh, is critical to me. But advice, um, in terms of health, I can make it a little bit easier. In terms of health, my advice is that no matter what age you are, you know whether you're you're one year old, and then those people aren't going to be listening too carefully to what I'm saying, <laughs> but up into 80, 90 to 100 years old, physical activity itself and using your muscles is vital to the way that your physiology actually operates, vital to your biochemistry, vital to the way you can control your blood glucose and your uh, your ability to uh, to think and move. So keeping physically active is is one piece of advice that I would give everybody, irrespective of their athletic endeavours. To the athletes, the only advice that I can think right offhand now that might be more universal is would never limit yourself as to what you think you can do. Because I reckon when you do limit yourself, you'll find that there's a way to go past that limit. So what you thought was a limit wasn't in the first place. You can always improve. There's always a way to improve your running, for example, we're talking about it, then we can think about this in, in any terms of in any sport, but there's always a way to improve. It's just that you've got to think about those things 
and thinking about the way to improve is is part of the beauty of um, of human performance, um, and that's part of the reason that I coach. I just love thinking about things and finding out ways to to do things better. Oh, brilliant, Dick. Uh, it brought up the question. I must ask you. I'd be uh, disappointed in myself if I didn't. It's a current age of biofeedback data. There's never been it's never been easier for athletes and coaches, for that matter, to have data at you know at our fingertips. Uh, where's the line between too much data, not enough data, and running by feel, for example? What's your sort of thoughts around that in the modern era of technology? Oh, I think you know the data is the data is fine, but uh, you know like. Understanding and being able to map, you know, your, again, I could talk about lots of different sports, but if we just stick to the running, um, understanding, you know, what your reps were and comparing that with somebody else that you know and all those things, they, they all add up to maintaining interest and motivation. And I applaud those things. I don't take as much notice of those things as what my athletes do. I don't really care what another athlete's doing that I don't coach. Um, I, I only care because I want that athlete, if he's an Australian athlete or someone I know, I want them to run well. But, but it's not going to if it's not going to affect my coaching. Well, that I, I don't get too much involved. I've got other things to think about. But I I think in this in this, this era where we can we can measure get feedback from um, measuring lactates and measuring heart rates, uh, looking at the uh, the times and the terrains and the elevations and all those sorts of things. I think it makes things more systematic, and when we become more systematic, it allows us to think about it more, and we can improve more. So the more feedback we can get, the more information we can get, to me, adds to the fun of it. It, it just adds to the fun of it. I, I'd love to know what a, an athlete's max VO2 is and what their uh, running economy is, for example. Now, I know those two things aren't the be-all, end-all in a runner because there are a lot of other factors involved, but just knowing those two things gives me a clue as to how that athlete might respond best or whether they're going to respond to altitude training uh, or whether they're going to respond to an altitude tent. Those are the sort of things and how they respond. That sort of feedback, to me, adds to the interest of everything and just gives you little clues as to how to improve that athlete, which is, after all, what us coaches are on about the whole time. Uh, brilliant. Dick, uh, I ask everyone uh, where I can a personality question. If Dick Telford could have three people at a dinner table, living, oh, or, living or past, a fun one here, who is at Dick Telford's table and why? Oh, gee. Oh, oh goodness me. Well, I'd, I'd certainly like to, um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear what, um, you know, like top, top coaches and top runners. It, it, I'll, I'll talk internationally. There's a lot of people in Australia that have been fantastic. But, yeah, I'd like to go back in time and, and, and sit down with Percy Serity, for example. Yeah. <laughs> He'd probably be 120 now, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I, I met him briefly when I was playing you know, some AFL games and he, he, he came across and gave us a talk and, uh, and I, I thought he was a crazy man then, but I I know he's not a, just a crazy man. And the way Herb Elliott talks about his coach, Percy Serity, he'd be a great person to talk to. I've had the pleasure of sitting next to John Landy and also with people like Herb Elliott um, clearly, the you know locals like Rob Dick are still champions. I'd I'd sit down with dinner with those people any time. Now, sitting down with John Landy and talking with him about his training when we're both on a, a board down in Melbourne for a place place called the Blue Earth Institute, looking after health of kids. Um, I just found talking to John Landy as just fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Roger Bannister came across and had a chat with me in my in my office at one stage um, in at the institute here in Canberra. I, uh, he died a while back, unfortunately. We know that, but what a man to be able to talk to him—not just about his running, but about his his work in the neuromuscular, the neural area, his work as a clinician that he um, studied yeah. at Oxford University. There's a, there, there are a few examples. I've stuck to running because that's the theme of what we're talking about. Yeah. But I could name a hell of a lot. It's Mo Farah. <laughs> I had the opportunity to sit down with him over in, as I mentioned before, over in Flag. What a fantastic person to talk to. Alberto Salazar, again, uh, with his experience, and he's, he's such, you know, he's got himself in a couple of predicaments with what he does, I suppose, but he's a very creative and a likeable, terrific fellow to talk to, you know, Alberto. Uh, just delightful fellow, and he does his very, very best as a coach. I admire him as well. There are a few names that, that I've 
banded around. And, but my colleagues here in Australia, you know, the likes of you know, Pat Cloessy and Chris Wardlaw and these sorts of people, you know, Steve might have get his, uh, they're, they're just fantastic people to talk to. Ah, Dick, that's brilliant. Lastly, uh, the physical challenge for the week from Dick Telford to listeners. What's Dick Telford's physical challenge going to be to listeners? Well, um, I don't know whether people can do this because people work and they can't they can't do what I I can arrange to do because I can work you know at midnight or I can work at six o'clock I can work at the university I can work in the library, <laughs> but I like to try and do something that gives me a bit of physical activity twice a day. Now that I'm, I'm not I'm not a fit person anymore in terms of fitness fitness you know, but in terms of health fitness I am. And I just feel I'm missing out on something if I don't do two, two bits of really good physical activity a day. It might be cycling to work, for example. I don't cycle to work, but I go for a run. But it might be cycling to work. That'd be one. Another one would be going for a run with my runners. Well, other people wouldn't have the opportunity to do that, but it might be going for a run out in the bush or just in close by or Canberra's a big bush city. I can do that anyway and, and scare a few kangaroos and parakeets, you know. So <laughs> twice a day, twice a day doing something that's like brisk walking or better, Going out for a walk is fantastic for most people. It doesn't really satisfy me. I just like to jog along, but that's just me. Um, and doing that twice a day, it might be going shopping once for getting and going a parking car a little bit further away uh, and, uh, and then doing something at night with the kids. But twice a day, doing something that's brisk walking for at least half an hour or so, that's the challenge that I would give people and they, they would definitely live, um, in my opinion, humble opinion, uh, a much more productive and uh, higher quality life and probably longer life as well. Dick, you mentioned the word humble. You are a humble gentleman. Uh, I think that's very clear and evident. Your career stands alone as really one of uh, you know Australia's great sporting contri- contributors uh, and successful careers as well uh, in what you've done. So you are an Australian uh, icon and you know the 2017 ACT Senior, Senior uh, Citizen of the Year there for the Australian of the Year Awards. So Dick Telford, thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule uh, to uh, to share with myself and listeners today. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you, Brad, and I look forward to catching up in the near future. So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show. I trust you enjoyed Dick Telford and his share-ins today. If you did, then please let both Dick and myself know You'll find me over at Brad underscore beer on both Instagram and Twitter, or I'm just an email away, b.beer at pogophysio.com.au. You can find Dick over on Twitter at Dick Telford, all one word. If you know anyone who would enjoy or get a lot out of Dick's sharings, and be sure to tag them in, share the love with them, that'd be excellent. Thank you to everyone who's been subscribing and also leaving ratings or reviews over on iTunes. Reviews really do help the Physical Performance Show get into the earbuds of more people who, just like yourself, are looking to pursue and perform at their physical best. A big thank you to this week, Positivism, that's a mouthful, who rated the show five stars, commenting top stuff. This is just full of useful tidbits for any athlete, no matter your sport. I love how Brad asks the questions I want to know, including what they eat and when they sleep. Thanks, Brad. Thank you for leaving your review. A big thank you to the team who make the Physical Performance Show possible. That's Susan Wilkin on all things administration, Matthew Walding, all things graphic design, and Daryl Misson, our amazing audio engineer. Of course, another big thank you to today's show sponsor, the Gold Coast Marathon. Podcasts, whilst free to download, are not free to produce, and the Gold Coast Marathon support goes an enormous way. Thank you. Don't forget to take your podsy, that's a screenshot of the episode that you're listening to, and share it around on social media for your chance to win a signed copy of the recently released, revised, and expanded second edition of my bestseller, You Can Run Pain-Free. I love seeing these popped up and the interesting places that you're training and the episodes that are connecting with you. So thank you. Keep the podsies coming. Talking about you can run pain-free, 
The recently released revised and expanded edition is available in paperback and soon to be internationally across all the normal platforms. If you're inside of Australia and you'd like to pick up your copy of the revised and expanded edition, you can jump over and simply use the promo code RUNPAINFREE, lowercase 25, that's 25, to receive 25% off the recommended retail price of $29.95. Inside the 400 pages, you will find the five steps that I've discovered throughout my physiotherapy career will help you enjoy injury-free and faster running. Now, coming up in next week's episode of the Physical Performance Show, we keep the Coach's Corner theme going, in particular, the Distance Running Coach's theme. Next week, we feature a conversation that I had recently with Adam Diddick. Adam Diddick is the head coach of Team Tempo Run, which hails out of Adelaide, Australia. He's also the coach of Jess Trangove, who took the bronze medal behind Lisa Waitman, Dick Telford's runner, in the Commonwealth Games at 2018 here on the Gold Coast. Jess recently ran a sterling 2.26 in the Gold Coast 2018 marathon. And aside from Jess, Adam is nurturing a whole new wave of Australian distance running talent. We get really nitty gritty in this conversation, speaking about load management, coaching philosophies, and how to maximize your running potential. So until then, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show.